Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world today. And thank you very much for joining us here for Procurement Leaders Live. This is one of our one of our first LinkedIn Lives of the year. And we're very excited to bring together a, a great group to look at key steps to adapting your 2021 external workforce strategy. Um, I'm Steve Hall. I'm with Procurement Leaders. And I'm really excited to kind of dig into this topic and put some questions to the, the wonderful panel that we've got here today. Why, why are we talking about this, though? I think it's important to kind of recognize that 2020 was a year like no other in recent memory, and 2021 promises to be the same. And particularly when we look at something like external workforce, there are key questions here that procurement needs to answer and businesses as a whole need to answer. And I think what's really interesting, and one of the things I'm looking forward to, to kind of putting to, to, to our panel today, um, is to kind of think about what are the changes that have been brought about by by the lockdowns that took place by the effects of covid and what are some of the other recent workforce trends that we've seen how are they affecting how people need to think about how they buy um how they work with external labor um and i really think looking at that strategy how technology can support it and how we can kind of adapt to some of the challenges we've seen coming down the track this can provide extremely powerful stuff for procurement teams to be working with um we're delighted to have partnered with SAP Fieldglass to produce a, a recent white paper. I'll ask my colleague um, to put that in, uh, put a link to that in the chat. If you haven't had a chance to read this, um, it really kind of sets the tone for uh, for a lot of the conversation we're having today around engaging the external workforce and what procurement's role is unlocking, in unlocking that value. So I do recommend if you either now or later you want to take a moment to click and, and download that so you can have a read. It definitely kind of fleshes out some of the stuff we're going to be talking about. Um, I would also say you know, I'm going to introduce our wonderful panel in a moment, but if you do have any questions, um, you do have anything you want to ask uh, to our panelists, don't hesitate, put those into the, the comments section there, and hopefully we'll get a chance to get to your question uh, as we go along. So yeah, don't wait for me, don't wait for the introduction or wait on manners, please do put those across. Okay, um, you know, maybe that's enough for me for a moment. Uh, let, let's meet our panel. So first, I'm, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Andreas Hetver, uh, VP and Group Procurement Category Director with Capgemini. Um, he's been working with Capgemini since 2004 in, in, in different procurement roles, amongst others as uh, European CPO. Um, and currently he heads the global procurement category for contingent workforce and professional services. Uh, and they've been doing some really interesting stuff there. So one, one of Andreas's key accountabilities is, is the evolution of the existing global contingent workforce program um, and it kind of linking together all the all the different requisite pieces to make a, a composite strategy. And, and really, you know, one of the things I'm looking forward to hearing from about but you know, hearing about from from Andreas is, you know, how do they face how are they facing up to some of these dramatic changes in the labour market and addressing talent everywhere, whether employed, contracted, retention? How are they thinking about that? And that's very much something that you know Andreas has got a unique perspective on. So, so thank you very much for joining us today, Andreas. Welcome. Thank you very much, and I'm delighted to, to be here. Excellent. And we're looking forward to, to putting some questions to you in a moment. I'm also really pleased to be, be uh, joined by SAP Fieldglass General Manager and, and one of uh, someone who I've had a, the fortune of interviewing before, uh, Arun Srinivasan. Arun, um, he, he's been with the company for eight years uh, and he's focusing on ensuring the success of SAP Fieldglass customers. But one of the things that really, I think, it, it makes us excited to kind of bring him to the table today. He has 20 years of helping global corporation design and deploy enterprise sof software solutions. He's held positions at Click Commerce, Elance, Oracle, and really, you know, understanding the, the, the vendor management solution space and understanding what those tools can do, how they can help customers. That really brings a useful, hugely useful perspective to this conversation and our thinking about how we build out this strategy. So Arun, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you here. Same here. Good to see you. Good stuff. OK, guys, so we are going to run this as a, a, a tight 25 minute set of questions. But I really wanted to kick off with something that was uh, to me, it, it's important to understanding like a, a little bit of context setting. Why are we here? So, uh, Arun, I might come to you with this one first. Why do you think external workforce is such an important category of spend? Why is it worth us focusing on it in this way? Mm -hmm. Good one. So, um, first of all, I would uh, I, I just want to take a moment to define external workforce in that context. And really, when we think about external workforce, we are thinking about all the workers who are helping you get work done who are not on your payroll. So they are not your employees, not your payroll employees. So in that context, you have contractors, consultants, freelancers, and you know different parts of the world. We call them different things. And they're coming into third party providers, agencies, consulting firms, et cetera. So that's what we mean by the external workforce. 
Now, why are they important? The first and foremost reason is that um, there are many of them in any organization, and and um, in, whether you look at it by the number of workers or volume of spend, it, const it constitutes a substantial amount. The second is the fact that it's a category of spend, if you look at it from a procurement lens, it's a category of, a sp of spend that's relatively speaking, I would say, uh, undermanaged. So there, there is opportunity to uh, derive more savings, drive better business performance in general. And the third thing I would say is in the context of um, what we have experienced, you, you mentioned that it's an unusual year. What, you know, what we see organizations do is take um, postures which range all the way from a very defensive posture saying, let me just hunker down and see what happens to organizations that are saying, let's use this opportunity to understand what's likely to happen in the next generation and differentiate ourselves. And that's where external work for the external workforce, how you think about it, how you, uh, comp you use it to complement your existing employees makes a big difference in how you evolve coming out of this crisis. So that's how I see it. And I think that is fascinating. Andreas, I really want you to build on that because, and you mentioned about coming out of the crisis, right? There's, there's two things at play, as I said, there is the evolution and the trends that you have around workforce. There are you know, people wanting to work in different ways, um, the, the connectivity that you get with a lot of modern tools that allows you to do that. These things were happening anyway. There were trends happening anyway. I'm sure you've seen these, Andreas, right? Um, but then you've also had this kind of complete sideways shift that's come with the effect of coronavirus and the various lockdowns, which I can only imagine has, has accelerated some things as well. What have you seen? How have those trends played out as you've seen them, Andreas? Yes, let, let me first of all um, build on what Arun said, right? So the first thing is that we have seen over the last years really uh, an increase in the uh, contingent workforce market. First of all, in uh, the number of talents that are there, it started for sure like, uh, like uh, in many cases in, in North America, but we see it as well in the European countries. So it's more the younger generation uh, that is uh, more likely uh, to, to go into contingent. And on the other side, also the top professionals at a certain moment uh, start to become uh, contingent, right? So that means uh, the, the ones that you would like to attract, the younger ones and as, uh, as well as the, the top professionals uh, at a certain moment become, as I said, uh, more contingent. And uh, what helps to do this is for sure the technology, all the platforms that you have outside there uh, with embedded end-to-end uh, -end services uh, to make it quite easy for these guys uh, to uh, become contingent. And uh, it's also for them more flexible in uh, uh, yeah, what kind of job they want to take, what, uh, what's more in their interest, and for sure also a personal income at a certain moment, right, is uh, one of the interests. On the other side, we have done, for example, from Capgemini side, um, fluid workforce research, uh, and uh, that was also quite recent, just to understand what is about the demand, right? We asked the big companies, uh, what do they think about uh, contingent workforce? And most of them have said that, especially now after the, uh, yeah, the COVID crisis, uh, that uh, there will be an increase up to 40% uh, on uh, contingent workforce demand. Um, there are many reasons for it, right? On the one side, it's uh, regarding agility. That means uh, fulfillment of highly skilled and niche skills that uh, normally are not uh, existing in the, in the own company. On the other side, uh, uh, speed uh, to get uh, things done. Uh, so that was the second topic. Third one was uh, to achieve a competitive advantage by attracting uh, higher quality talents. Because in many cases, you don't have the right talents there. You see uh, there's so much going on in IT, artificial intelligence, automation, and other topics. And you need to have the highly skilled people, and they are not available immediately uh, for permanent recruitment, right? And uh, last but not least, it's also a cost uh, perspective, because there's always a question about uh, a permanent hire compared to uh, a contingent one. Uh, it always depends on how long you think you need some such kind of specific capabilities, for example. So all this uh, leads to the point that uh, the continuous workforce uh, yeah, will increase uh, and not only uh, before the COVID crisis, even after it. Uh, absolutely. And I think, you know, it, 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 it's, it's definitely interesting to think about the fact that, you know, you said, Erin, uh, that this is maybe in potentially an undermanaged area of spend. And certainly I know that you guys have done research that indicates as such. And yet what, we, what we're hearing is that to some degree that this area of spend, you know, getting it right enables business strategy. If you can't have a flexible workforce, you can't have these skills, you can't be able to get access to, you know, potentially we've talked about, you know, younger um, recruits, et cetera, that, that can limit the, the ability of the business, particularly 
at a time when we're looking to be more flexible. Um, I want to start to think, you know, in the time we've got, and, and guys, thank you, by the way, I want to say thank you for the comments we've had so far. If you do have questions for our, our panel, do, don't forget to get those in because we're, we're just getting started. But um, I did want to say, I, mean, I, I wanted to think about, you know, okay, so we've identified that this is a need and I've not, I'm not seeing anybody arguing with this at the moment. What what might we be doing about it? You know, what what seem to be some of the key steps as as, you know, as we're looking at, uh, and maybe you can help us understand a little bit around the the, the role of 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 technology here uh, and the role that you know a VMS. Maybe help us understand for those who don't know what a VMS is, and, and and give us a bit of a context for the role that might play in creating value for the business, given what we've been talking about. Sure. <clears throat> so a, a VMS or a vendor management system. It is, you know, broadly speaking, it's a system that helps you find, engage, and, and manage uh, external workforce, external workers in different forms. And I, I referred to the different forms earlier. And and really, what from a business perspective, you think about it, the you're trying, you have demand on one side, and if you, especially if you're a larger business, that demand comes from different functions within your organization, and then you have supply, talent supply which is very uh, specific to your business, where you're located, your your needs, et cetera. And um, the, the, the a vendor management solution, uh, what it does, a solution like SAP Fieldless, is it helps you connect the, the, the demand and the supply effectively, efficiently, in a way that, um, first of all, the, uh, the, the rules of the organization, whether it's compliance related or other guidelines are automatically enforced, but also in a way that the end user is really focused on thinking about how do I get work done? It's really not about the business process per se, it's not about the software solution, but it's really what's the best way to get this body of work done? And the, what the software does is once the organization, the, the information is captured in a structured format, it provides the insight through analytics, whether it's uh, you know graphs and charts or you look at predictive analytics, it, it provides the insight to ultimately help you make better decisions around some of the topics that Andreas talked about. Excellent. I, I, please do build I can, on it. I can, I, can, I can build on this one. I think from our perspective, we have uh, addressed it into, into four categories of, of benefits, right? The first one is business impact uh, improvement because uh, in the beginning, before we uh, came with, with uh, SAP C class uh, VMS, uh, we did not really have an idea about the, num the number of headcount, the tenure of engagement, the classification of work uh, capabilities that we have sourced and other things, right? So the visibility in these kind of details was really missing. And we said we need to have this visibility first, as you rightly said, Arun, uh, to create control about uh, what we want to do in the future and to take strategic uh, decisions. So the business impact on the one side, the cost optimization on the other side, because the moment you have an idea about what you purchase, how much you purchase, you have uh, the idea about the capabilities and the rate that you pay in the different uh, uh, countries, be it in China, India, in the US, France, wherever, right? So we have also built some kind of structure around this one, uh, which we have uh, been able then to uh, to do it with, uh, uh, with SAP C class. And now we have uh, proper reporting. We know exactly what we purchase, how much, and what price we pay. Finally, and uh, you're right about this one, it's about uh, risk mitigation. So all about uh, compliance because there's so many um, tax, uh, legal and statutory requirements in the different countries that you need to deal with. And uh, for sure, all this needs to be managed accordingly. And so this was also the third point and fourth, but last, what was uh, the process efficiency? We really wanted to have an end-to-end -end solution from the demand up to the uh, payment of invoices, plus all this kind of uh, reporting. And this helped us really uh, to to deliver our strategy with the right technology. So the business case is there. The 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 understanding of the opportunity is there. The technology enables it. So I guess my question, maybe to flip things around, is what why why haven't we made more progress? Maybe why have more more companies, more procurement teams not made more progress? What's been stopping us taking a step in evolving this? Um, thus far. I put that to you guys in the chat. I'm interested to hear what some of your challenges are, maybe. Why Why perhaps is this still perhaps undermanaged? But Andreas, maybe you can offer us a perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, what, what are some of the, the challenges that, that, that are that have prevented progress in this area? And, and do you see them changing, potentially? Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, personally, um, in the beginning, um, there was, uh, let's, let's go like this, continuous workforce is, is not um, a strategic component, or it was not a strategic component in the past, right? 
uh, most companies and uh, have uh, really um, focused on permanent recruitment, on making sure attracting the right talents to permanent recruitment, uh, develop them, uh, retain them in the organization, and by doing so, uh, growing the capabilities of the companies. As I said earlier, uh, there's a paradigm change in the market right now. Uh, so the more contractors are, are, are available, uh, more people want to be a contingent, even uh, the top talents uh, with uh, the right seniority also uh, go into this kind of direction. So it's more the change towards the total workforce management rather than managing only permanent uh, employees. And this is one of the changes uh, that happen uh, where everybody now needs to think about how can we uh, make uh, continuous workforce part of our uh, talent strategy. And uh, technology on the other side uh, really helps here in, in driving things forward. There are so many uh, things right now owing going on. On the one side, we have uh, companies like SAP C-Class with the right uh, system in place, but SAP C-Class also has uh, the, the proper network partners, uh, which um, can be embedded into such kind of solutions. We, for example, have uh, implemented our freelancer gateway by Capgemini, where we attract contractors uh, directly right now with our employer brand and by doing so, uh, use our employer brand to get the right talent independent of whether they finally want to be permanently employed or just contracting. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, Arun, you're going to build on that. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to jump on that. The last point in particular, I, I feel is uh, one of these things that's changing our market where uh, you know, Andreas mentioned about uh, you know attracting freelancers and other talent directly, right? And so, the, uh, at, a, at a macro level, it's also the 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 desire of the workforce that's influencing mm -hmm. the change. And it's also, I would say, another factor is that it's being aided by the norms, guidelines, in some cases, the le legislation that's being clarified around this area that's allowing businesses to go engage workers in different forms. I mean, there's there's an interesting comment there. You know, I just I just put this out. There was a comment in the in the chat saying that uh, one of our listeners would like to understand more on consolidating contingent workforce vendors regionally or globally, keeping varying laws and pricing. I guess this is part of the challenge for any team looking to manage this category of spenders, thinking about how they can have that breadth of vision to be able to understand the different implications in the different markets. And I suppose this is where it needs that marriage of technology technological capability and the willingness of the team and the expertise of the team to manage it at those different levels. Right, yeah. and also what Andrea said about it, elevating it from being at a functional level, let's say sitting inside procurement or HR or line of business to say, no, it's at a business level and I'm going to include the right stakeholders from business, from procurement, from HR, from finance to solve this problem. Yeah, Andreas, do you, do you see that developing? Because I mean, looking at some of the work that you do, it, it must be key to have that um, that buy-in across the different parts of the business so that this is a solution that applies across HR, acro across business units. I imagine that's absolutely. a solution you've had to drive. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and uh, you're right about this one. You need to have the business interaction. You can't, for example, we in, in Capgemini as procurement own the contingent workforce uh, management. We, we uh, own the, the complete program. And we are also a delivery organization in this case because we deliver also the right capabilities towards our business. But for sure, you, you can't just do it uh, with, with um, uh, how to call it, uh, some suppliers that you just uh, define, right? You need to be very much aligned with the business. You need to have an, a strategy. You need to have a plan about what the business wants to, to focus on, uh, what is more or less the um, demand in the future uh, based on the, uh, on the strategy as such. And by doing so, you get an uh, idea about what kind of capabilities might be needed in the future and then you can start proper sourcing projects in the different countries because for sure there are differences in the different countries and uh, when you when you source correctly when you have the right preferred supply base then you can manage it accordingly uh, with um, an end-to-end -end process uh, that we have uh, established right so and we in capgemini we have also uh, decided to, to do an internal um, managed service provider it means we ourselves manage the contingent workforce program. We have not outsourced it. And that means uh, we need to source proper uh, providers in the different countries uh, to deal with the needs that we have. And, and I just think this is fascinating, really, because this is it, this is also the story of procurement development, because the more that you can uh, have control of this area of spend and enable uh, your business partners to have access to the right talent, 
this isn't old school procurement, right? This is this is a development in terms of the ability to to provide that value. Um, Arun, I want to pick up one thing quickly with you. Um, you know, we were talking about uh, you know the value that VMSs can bring from the buyer side. Would you mind offering just a quick take on on the supplier side of that? Because also, you know, it's being able to work with a system that they can kind of access and, and use. Make you know, it, it, I suppose it, it's a, a lot easier for suppliers to engage with the right buyers. Right. Yeah. I, I would offer a couple of things. It's a it's a, it's a really important topic. We as a community, I would submit, is uh, tend to uh, not. Um, uh, focus as much on suppliers and the workers as we need to. Um, so the, to, to the two points I would offer there is one is from a supplier's perspective, ultimately their goal is to grow their business, right? And uh, when, you, when you use a system, uh, a vendor management system, uh, fundamentally what you're doing is you're capturing information in a structured format. And what that lets you do as a supplier is to differentiate yourself because then you're able to show that you are better than your peers at providing a certain service, a certain product in some cases. And so, so that's the very first thing is it makes the discussion more objective. So whether it's scorecards and so on. So for example, in our system, it's the same data that the supplier sees as the buyer sees. So you can have an objective conversation around it. There are no surprises. Uh, and, and the second thing is to do with the efficiency of the supplier's operations. So whether it's um, data related to timesheets, invoices, or other tax-related regulations, by providing the right APIs to plug into their own front office systems and their back office systems, we make it really easy for them to operate efficiently and scale. Exactly, and I, I, let me build on this one. I only I can agree with, with all the points that you have mentioned right now. Maybe to add one more topic, this is uh, related to what I said earlier, the sourcing of our preferred suppliers. It's a reliability of um, of demand flow for the uh, for our preferred suppliers because when we we do our sourcing we need to make sure that we uh, um, that we also can can be sure that that the demand flows to these uh, suppliers finally and by doing the sourcing activity then plugging the suppliers into our uh, VMS system make sure that all um, demand flows really to our preferred supply base. So it's a reliable uh, demand flow for them. And I think this is also uh, some big advantage for our preferred suppliers. Then. Excellent point, guys. Thank you for addressing that. Um, a couple of things I want to get to, and I'm appreciating that I'm, I'm running it, getting shorter on time. Um, visibility. Talk to me about visibility. This is a, potentially a key enabler that accompanies your external workforce strategy. Um, maybe I can hear a little bit from both of you on this one. So. I suppose maybe maybe I'll start with you, Arun. What does visibility mean for an external workforce strategy? What, what do you think is, are the keys to to understanding that? Mm -hmm. So at a basic level, it's first uh, we talked about elevating the topic, where first understanding that this is a topic that's relevant to the business performance of the company itself, and and then getting into the underlying details around. Okay, so what do we mean by that? So really thinking about you know who. Who, so when, we, when it applies to external workforce, who is really working for us? What are they doing? What are the job roles that they're employed in? What skills do they bring? Where are they located? What are they getting paid? And so on. And getting that information in a format which helps you then uh, complement your existing workforce helps you build that holistic strategy to say whether you're looking at it from a spend dimension or you're looking at it from a talent dimension, I'm able to create that holistic total workforce strategy to figure out what's the most effective way of getting work done. So that when you get to that level of visibility, it gives you the maturity to flip the model and think less about, you know, what's the business process I need to follow or you know, how do I engage an external worker or how do I budget for these employees? Instead, you're thinking more about what is the best way for the organization to get this body of work done given the constraints that I have around me. And that makes sense to the stakeholders, right? That's something that everybody can understand because that's that you share that objective. What, what do you think, Andreas? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, exactly this, right? Uh, knowing exactly um, uh, who is working for us, for how long, which kind of capabilities, what do you pay for it? And just an example, uh, during the pandemic uh, last year, uh, there was a clear need at a certain moment to, to understand who works for us right now, in which engagement, uh, to, and, uh, to ensure that uh, we have a proper business continuity uh, in the key engagement. So we were very quickly able to identify this, to uh, reach out to suppliers, 
uh, deal with the situation and make sure that finally we could uh, ensure business continuity for our clients. And this is um, a great advantage. Uh, for sure, nobody planned a situation like this, but VMS uh, helped us uh, tremendously in, in yeah, getting this information immediately. Great stuff. Okay, guys, I know there's, there's a little under five minutes left, a couple of things I want to get to. So a question that's come in that I like, what are the threats and trap possibilities while applying external workforce for the organization and how should it be kept within stable integrity? So I guess if we can, if I, I can maybe paraphrase it a, a little bit, we've talked about a lot of the, the benefits that's understood. We've talked about how technology can enable it, but this would be easy or we would all be doing it. So my question is, you know, what are some of these um, some of the things that people might watch out for as they're looking to scale up um, their capabilities in, the, in terms of managing their external workforce. Who would like to have a crack at that? I can take Andreas, please. So first of all, threats and, and threats. I think um, uh, TLS requirements, we call it. So tax, legal, statutory requirements. Make sure that you fully understand per country what are these kind of requirements. Uh, make sure that, uh, that compliance, that legal is part of the story immediately. Because uh, we have uh, yeah, also experienced that, that if you don't do this uh, correctly, then you set up a system and finally uh, somebody raises a finger and says, uh, have you thought about this kind of compliance issue? And then finally, some kind of configuration must, uh, must be uh, changed. Simple uh, topic, for example, IR35 uh, that's upcoming right now in the UK, classification of workers. This is something that we are currently uh, addressing and then making sure that we also reflect this accordingly uh, in VMS. And uh, these kind of discussions need to happen. So make sure compliance and risk and legal is part of it. Absolutely. Uh, Arun, anything jump out to you that you, you wanted to add there? Sure. A, a real quick two things I'd say is one is just having clarity on the business objectives throughout the process, not just when you first implement it, but on an ongoing basis. And that clarity typically comes when you elevate the topic to for it to be a strategic uh, topic within the company. The second thing I would say is as a provider, as, as someone who's been in this business for a very long time, I would say that we as a community have many times tend to over-engineer the solution. And so tend to make it onerous for the business user to, to whether through processes or tools to use a solution. And so we need to, again, um, Take, uh, take, uh, make it our responsibility to provide the simplest possible experience to the business user. And I think this chimes with what you, uh, what you were saying earlier as well. Is in terms of wrapping it all together, having that holistic approach, and being able to say, "How does this help you get work done?" I, I think that's fantastic. Um, we have a couple of minutes, so then the final thing I wanted to ask you: you know, we look at what's ahead. We look at, you know, I want people to leave here today having left this conversation thinking about. You know, what might they do differently? Where might they take action now? So Arun, I might start with you, then Andreas, I want to ask you uh, next, but what would you urge people to do if they, they've accepted that this is something that deserves attention, development, maybe investment as well? What steps do you think they should be taking to prepare for some of the challenges that are ahead of them? So real quick, uh, what, uh, sorry, go ahead. Arun, uh, Arun, Arun first, Arun, Arun, if I could ask you first, and then Andreas, I'll come to you. Good. So, so re real quick, first understand what's happening today within the organization. And, and so that's that's the obvious part. But then also really think about what's coming in the next five, 10 years. And really how does your external workforce strategy play a role there in helping your organization run efficiently, but also most importantly, helping your organization differentiate itself in your own markets. Fantastic, thank you, Arun. Uh, Andreas, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, quickly, uh, depends on uh, what kind of maturity you have for sure. From our perspective, for example, we have uh, VMS deployed in in all of the key countries right now, we think more about the new normal, about how can we use the contractors uh, more efficiently, how can we make them, how we can we create some kind of knowledgeable or trusted uh, 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 talent pool, so people that we can work with uh, regularly, for sure, under the compliance uh, uh, rules, but, but this is something that uh, we want to invest in right now for the future. And there is momentum around this conversation, both in the wider market and certainly probably within your business if you're listening today, guys. So this is the time to be doing that. I, I, that's all we've got time for. But I want to say a big thank you to Arun Srinivasan from SAP Fieldglass and a big thank you to Andreas Hetver from Capgemini. Guys, it's been great having you here and great being able to hear your perspectives. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, please do download our white paper. Um, we'll post the link in the comments. And please do join us again next time.